Good morning, friends. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Grace and peace to each of you. I am glad that you are here, grateful to all of you who are joining us on this journey during these tumultuous days as we seek a way forward guided by the grace and mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. We rejoice that some of our members have already received their first vaccine, their first dose of the vaccine. If you are 65 years of age or older, you are eligible to receive the vaccine. If you need assistance in making an appointment or even in getting a ride, to the vaccine site, please give me a call. We want to make sure that all of our folks are able to get a vaccine and that they are supported in doing that. Based on the threat of more violence on Inauguration Day, I will hold a brief prayer service for our nation on Tuesday night at seven o'clock on Zoom. This will be in lieu of the Bible study that was going to start this week. And a link will be sent out to you for, um, the, the Zoom link will be sent out to you on Monday. Jay Walker's is suspended indefinitely at this point, and I will be speaking with the parents of young children to talk about ways in which we can continue the faith formation of our children during this time. Friends, we are gathered by our God who knows us better than we know ourselves. Listen to these words from Psalm 139 as we call ourselves to worship. O oh Lord, you have searched me and known me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from far away. You search out my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. Even before a word is on my tongue, O oh Lord, you know it completely. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my thoughts. See if there is any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Let us pray. Almighty God, we come to you this morning overwhelmed and anxious. We are reeling from this relentless pandemic. We are weary from the consequences of a long season of isolation, economic disruption, and political upheaval. We are people of faith, those who put our trust in you and our hope in Jesus Christ. But we are tired and not sure how to move forward in faith and love. We believe that through Christ all things are possible. Lord, help our unbelief. If the storming of the Capitol was not more than enough, we hear there is rising chatter of more organized violence this week, both in Washington and at capitals across this country. Melt the hearts of those seeking to instigate and perpetuate violence. Lord, we pray for peace. Peace in our nation as we navigate transitions in leadership. Peace in our community. Peace among our family and friends. Open all of our eyes to see in each other our common humanity. Give us words to speak and ears to listen so that the hard work, the long work of justice and repair can find a foothold amid the tensions and anger of this moment. 
Oh God, you know us through and through. You know what is on our lips before we speak. You know the inner corners of our hearts. Search us, test us, root out our wicked ways, and lead us in the way everlasting. We pray in the name of the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. about a boy named Samuel. When Samuel was little, his mother brought him to the temple to live because she had promised God that Samuel would serve him all of his life. And the priest that was there, Eli, was to raise Samuel and to teach him all about God. But one night while Samuel was sleeping, he heard a voice. Samuel, Samuel. He ran to Eli and said, here I am. But Eli said, I didn't call you. Then Samuel went back to bed. Samuel heard a voice call his name two more times. Each time Samuel ran to Eli. Finally, Eli said, I think God is speaking to you. Next time say, yes, Lord, I am listening. Then Samuel went back to bed. Samuel, Samuel, the voice said again. This time Samuel answered, yes, Lord, I am listening. And from that moment on, Samuel gave messages to God's people. He was a special prophet of God. Now this is a pretty neat story because it reminds us that you don't have to wait to be a grown up for God to call you. God asks people of all ages to share his message. Now, you may hear a voice, just like your mom, if your mom was calling you, or it may be more like a voice inside your head, like a nudge or a tug. 
that you're supposed to do something or say something. Now, how are you going to know if this voice, this inside voice especially, is God? If what that inner voice asks you to do is telling you to do, if it's telling you to do something that is loving, then it's God. Help me to lead the congregation in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Be listening. Bye, boys and girls. Let us pray. Lord, we need to hear your voice. We need a word from you to guide the living of these days. Send your Holy Spirit to be in our listening and in my speaking. And may it remain in our hearts and change us. Amen. The Old Testament passage appointed for today comes from the book of 1 Samuel. This passage stands at the very beginning of the stories of the kingship in Judah and Israel. It is a prequel, if you know, if you will, of the anointing of the first king. Chronologically, the book of Samuel follows Judges, which sums up the predicament of the people in this way. In those days, there was no king in Israel. All the people did what was right in their own eyes. God's people had grown weary with the judges whose service was sporadic, rescuing the people only when their disobedience made them pray to their enemies. Israel longed for a king like the other nations. Of course, the question, the concern about having a king was, how would such a fallible human leader stay attuned to the voice of God once he was seated on his own throne? And so a new office begins to emerge, that of the prophet of the Lord, truth teller of the Lord, and Samuel is the first in line. Now, you may recall that Samuel was a miracle baby given to the barren Hannah after her desperate prayers in the house of the Lord. In response, Hannah brings her three-year-old son back to God and hands him over to live with Eli and to be in temple service there. According to one ancient scholar, Samuel was about 12 years old when he received this call from God. Now this story is familiar to many of you and particularly the beginning portion, but I invite you to listen with fresh ears as I read now 1 Samuel 3 verses 1 through 20. Hear now God's word to us this day. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called, Samuel, Samuel. And he said, Here I am, and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. 
But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel? Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time. And he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears of it tingle. On that day I will fulfill against Eli all I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God, and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house will never be reconciled by sacrifice or offerings. Samuel lay there until morning, and then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. He said, here I am. Eli said, what was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of, of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. Then he said, It is the Lord. Let him see, do what seems good to him. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Many of us know the story of God calling the boy Samuel. Samuel hearing God call him by name, but mistaking it for the call of his mentor and the priest Eli. The third time he heard his name called in the night, Eli perceives that it is the Lord calling him and prompts him as to what he should do. And so it is on the fourth time that our persistent God calls Samuel's name that Samuel responds, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. When we end our reading there, it is such a sweet story, really. The calling of a child, being called by name, an obedient response. It is such a nice story that it's easy to overlook the difficulty and the import of what God is calling Samuel to do. Like the ending of, the ju of Judges, the passage today begins on an ominous note. Not only was the word of the Lord rare in those days, but the leadership over Israel was corrupt. 
Eli's sons had been using their status as temple priests to satisfy their own desires. They were consuming the precious fat of the sacrifices. And they were lying with the vulnerable women who, like Samuel's mother Hannah, had come to worship the Lord and pray in the Lord's house. These were heinous sins in Israel's moral universe. A reckoning was coming. But who would speak truth to power? Well, God drops this important but oh-so-difficult task squarely in Samuel's lap. For Samuel must tell his mentor, the man who has raised him since he was a toddler, that a change in leadership is afoot. Eli's sons will be held accountable for their sins. And Eli will be held accountable as well, not because of evil acts he committed, but for his failure to act, his sins of omission. Eli recognized his son's sins, the ways that they perverted the sacred office of priest, and he did nothing whatsoever about it. Hesitantly, and only with the encouragement from Eli, Samuel shares the words given to him by God. It couldn't have been easy. It certainly came with risk. But Samuel spoke the truth as he had been told it, and the office of trustworthy prophet of the Lord was given birth. Richard Boyce, my old seminary professor and the Dean of Union Presbyterian Seminary at Charlotte, writes this. It takes both the attentiveness of the young Samuel's ears and the wisdom of the old priest's heart and mind to birth this new office in service of the Lord. It takes both the authority of the failing priest and the obedience of his young protege to bring the Lord's words out in the open. In other words, it takes a community to bear such a task. Friends, the times in which we live are perhaps not all that different from the biblical times in which this passage was set. We have a pandemic that has strained the fabric of this society as well as our own personal mental health. There have been some peaceful protests against government regulations, and there have been some violent ones, even an intercepted plan to kidnap a sitting governor. We are going through a racial reckoning in this country after the horrific killing of George Floyd and other people of color by the police. There were many peaceful protests, and there was also looting and burning of buildings and even the attempted takeover of a government building. And then there is what happened a week and a half ago that is beyond compare in intent to anything that we have experienced. A mob of primarily white people carrying symbols of both Christianity and white supremacy and white nationalism stormed the nation's capital, putting our whole democracy at risk, chanting calls to hang the vice president of the United States and kill the Speaker of the House. Now we have a president who has been impeached, and the Capitol and state capitals all over this country are bracing for potential violence, even as lawmakers have received death 
threats, for votes of conscience. Things are a mess. We need to hear the voice of God. We need to listen to the voice of God. We need to reflect on Christ's teachings, on his life, and with the help of the Holy Spirit, follow him so closely that we are the light of the world that we are called to be. For that light is so needed right now. Otherwise, it could be said of us in our time. All the people did what was right in their own eyes. That didn't work well in biblical times and it won't work well today. Like Eli, we need accountability for political leaders, religious leaders, and each one of us if we are to move to a more peaceful and just path. Now, I'm not advocating any particular means of accountability. Please hear me on that. But there must be some reckoning. And for us, not only reckoning for what we have said or done, but what we have failed to say and do. When, for instance, have we, like Eli, simply ignored the wrong before us because it was the easiest thing to do? When have we, by failing to name evil as evil, essentially blessed it as good? In 1967, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. wrote, Time is cluttered with the wreckage of individuals and communities that surrendered to hatred and violence. For the salvation of our nation and the salvation of, of mankind, we must follow another way. As the Church of Jesus Christ, we need to lead the way to another way. And if we are going to turn and follow another way, which could be called repentance, we have to see the truth in ourselves and our nation. And for that, we need each other. We need loving conversations with one another, conversations across political, religious, ideological, and whatever other divides there are that exist. Conversations in which we hold each other accountable, not judge one another, but hold each other accountable. Because it is so easy when tensions are high to go off the deep end in both our language and our thoughts. And because not one of us has all the answers. We all fall short of the glory of God one way or another. These conversations will not be easy, and maybe we are not even ready for them quite yet. I have often wondered if, or I have been wondering in recent, the last couple of weeks, would we be in the position that we are in um, politically and as a nation if this pandemic were not upon us, if we were not all so stressed out. And yet I believe that we, as difficult as it might be, we need each other to discern together how God is speaking into this moment. On this second Sunday after Epiphany, Boyce says it is important to note that with the birth of the office of prophet with Samuel, human speaking and human listening now become one of the main means by which the light of God's revelation breaks into the affairs of the world. And when the words of the Lord are rare, 
this listening and hearing becomes a communal affair, dependent upon both the hearing and the speaking of the community together. We need each other. We need to listen. We need to speak. We need to discern based on a shared set of facts. For there is not your truth and my truth, but a truth. I welcome those conversations with anyone who is willing to um, have those with me. The word of God Samuel delivered to Eli was both hard to give and hard to hear. And yet, ultimately, it was a good word because it was a word needed in order to move toward the renewal of Israel. The truth may be hard, but it is a necessary word to move toward renewal. Dr. King said, I believe that unarmed truth and unconditional love will have the final word in reality. This is why right, temporarily defeated, is stronger than evil triumphant. I wonder if that is just a more eloquent way of saying that God has the final word and God's word is a word of love, a word of truth, a love, a word of justice. The light of God's revelation in Jesus Christ continues to strive to break forth with power in the lives of the nations, even ours. May God grant us the courage both to hear and to speak, and to do it all with love. Amen. By the Lord of sea and sky, I have heard my people cry, all who dwell in dark and sin, my hand will save. I who made the stars of night, I will make their darkness bright. Who will bear my light to them? Whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will go, Lord, if you lead me. I will hold your people in my heart. I, the Lord of snow and rain, I have borne my people's pain. I have wept for love of them, they turn away. I will break their hearts of stone, give them hearts for love alone. I will speak my word to them, whom shall I send? Here I am, Lord. Is it I, Lord? I have heard you calling in the night. I will
friends, we have a number of members who have COVID right now. Hallie is sick with COVID and her family is all quarantined. Jessica and Aiden hope that they are on the other side of um, this virus and are improving. And John is now asymptomatic. So let us keep um, those members as well as the many others in our prayers. Let us go to God in prayer. Gracious God, you have searched us and know us and love us in ways that are beyond our understanding. We thank you for becoming flesh, for living among us, for dying and rising again, that we might practice becoming your holy body, living in peace with all your other creatures. We give thanks for the warmth of hot soup on a chilly afternoon, for the wonderful smell of a hot meal coming from the oven, for a cool glass of water when we are tired and thirsty. We give thanks for family who have seen us at our best and at our worst and love us still, for friends who challenge and encourage us, for children who remind us of the wonder and joy at the heart of your creation. O oh Lord, before we speak, you know our prayers, and still we need to speak the words that fill our heart. For our grief, our concerns are more than we can bear. The numbers are staggering. Most of the faces of those lost to COVID are unknown to us. Yet we know they are sons and daughters, husbands and wives, grandmothers and grandfathers and cousins. They were teachers and nurses, bankers and construction workers, volunteers and students and retirees. Some were homeless some without families. Each was your beloved child. Comfort those who mourn. Give strength and health to those who are sick. Uphold health care workers and clear the way for a speedy distribution of vaccine. Give each of us determination to take personal responsibility for measures that protect us all. Lord, we pray for our nation. Protect those charged with protecting the safety of public officials across this country. Protect leaders, civil servants, and their families facing violent threats for exercising the duties of their offices. Grant all of our elected leaders wisdom and patience and courage to work together for the common good and to restore a spirit of partnership among us. O oh God, on this weekend when our nation celebrates the life of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., animate courage in us so that we might confront realities that deform and deface our country that he spoke so powerfully about, the realities of racism and poverty and violence. Empower us, guide us to participate in your reconciling and justice-seeking work in our midst, just as he did. Finally, O oh God, we pray for ourselves and those we love. If the pain and anxiety in the world around us were not enough, many of us have personal struggles as well. Grief, loneliness, anxiety, and addictions. We worry about loved ones in high-risk jobs and loved ones we cannot visit or hug. 
Some of us face financial uncertainty as this pandemic lingers. Oh Lord, come to our aid. Today, we especially pray for our members with COVID. Hallie, Jessica, Aiden, and John. May they recover swiftly and without complication. O oh God, help us to be those who follow our Lord so closely that we emulate him, even unconsciously. May we be truth tellers, mercy givers, love spreaders, light shiners. May we be those who refuse to give up on the God-given goodness of all creation and of every human being. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. Amen. Friends, go out into the world in peace. Have courage. Hold on to what is good. Do not repay evil for evil. Support the weak. Help the suffering. Honor all people. Love and serve the Lord, rejoicing in the power of the Holy Spirit. And the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit abide with you this day and always. Amen. May the God of hope go with us every day, filling all our lives with joy and love and peace. May the God of justice feed us on our way, bringing light and hope to every land and race. Praying, let us work for peace. Singing, share our joy with all. Working for a world that's new, faithful when we hear Christ call.